Welcome back, everyone, to the Unconventional Money Moves podcast. I got my Florida State brother, Michael Show, with us today. Played football at Florida State, took his talents from the field to the business world, and he's doing a lot of cool things, running Full Circle Agency. He's in a movie, and he did like 100 other things that we don't have time to talk about today. So he's going to bring the heat. He's going to bring the fire. He's going to bring the knowledge. We're going to talk about how he took his talents, shutting down wide receivers at Florida State to uh-huh. closing down business deals in the real world. So happy to have Mike on today. So Mike, let's uh, chat about that. How did how did you take your talents from the field of football to the field of business? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And, and, and for those and for everybody who's listening, first things first, really excited the opportunity to speak with you folks here today. And, and thank you for carving out some time to, lift, to listen to this conversation. My intention is to make sure that it's valuable and there's some some key key takeaways, right? Um, as as far as as far as that transition and and what I took away from the field and and what we implemented in the business room, you know, there, there's one or two things that are just inevitable. You know, there's one or two things that are that that, that make total sense. The first thing is incredible, incredible discipline and intentionality on the goal on the on the outcome on on what's to be achieved no matter if it's football or if it's a business you know there needs to be a sense of discipline and that discipline has to do with your schedule that discipline has to do with the intentionality of everything that you do within that schedule because you know as opposed to maybe winning a national championship right now right the, 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 right now the goal is to build a billion dollar brand but there's a target in sight there is an end goal there is an end vision and only when you have that do I feel that the actions that are set forth and taken every single day will lead to that thing? It's, if you don't have that target, it's like getting into a car, not knowing where you're going and just getting on the road and driving. Yeah, 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 you're moving, but where the hell are you going? Are you going backwards or forwards? So that's the first thing, that discipline, but discipline with intentionality and focused on a, on a goal. And then the second thing, the second thing is, listen, you got to have a playbook, man. You got to have a playbook. I don't know one. I don't want one team that's that that does significant without a playbook. I don't know one team that does significant without proper coaching. I don't know one team that does significant without the right people around you. And I think life is just the simulation of sport at a much larger scale. You've got to have a playbook. You've got to you've got to be able to tap into coaching. You've got to be able to tap into mentorship, and you've got to have some of the right people around you. Otherwise, you're not going to achieve anything that it is that you're seeking to achieve. And so, so, so tapping in on all three of those fronts and realizing that you need all those three fronts um, that that's another thing that I definitely took into the business world, and you know that's helped us so far. So, so how how is that transition from the football field to reality per se uh because i mean you grew up your whole life playing football Mm -hmm. yes sir at a high level Mm -hmm. obviously in high school you're the man you Mm -hmm. get the college you're the man then all of a sudden you're in the real world and it's like man i mean i'm not the man anymore like what's going on yeah yeah Yeah. i mean the transition from sports and outside of sports i mean it's it's it's, you know it's it's difficult in the sense of, of of the identity that you embody from a very young age is, is, is no longer the, the identity that you can associate yourself with. And so you have to build a completely new identity. Right. And um, with any identity that anybody builds, it's, 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 it's based off a, a massive foundation of year in and year out grit work and force to be good at that thing that you're associated with. So you go from, you know, playing sports and then you go to running a business and it's, it's a different ball game, no pun intended in the sense of, okay, well, now you got to understand as opposed to understand what, what, you know, cover three is. Now you got to understand market penetration, market density, marketing and advertising, the importance of sales, funnels, how to manage people, just the whole nine yards, everything that we got to do every single day and running a business. So the transition, you know, it was difficult at first, but again, luckily, Luckily, I had academics to fall on. Luckily, I didn't just, you know, I wasn't just sleep and relaxation all throughout college and post-college. You know, we were in some real classes that challenged me from a, a mental standpoint and, and allowed for us to, 
to figure this thing out today. So that's what I could say about that transition. Totally. And I had an interesting thought before we hopped on here. Yeah. Like everyone wants to be, if you watch basketball, everyone wants to be LeBron James, Steph Curry, but mm-hmm. watch football, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady's the man uh, for the quarterback position. But, but I thought to myself, people actually have a better chance of becoming Warren Buffett than becoming those guys. Yeah, man. It's, that's a valid point. I like thought about that. I was like, you have a better, you have a better chance of becoming like an Elon Musk or a Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos and becoming an athlete. Because being an athlete, you have to have incredible discipline. Also, you have to have initial talent and then hard work on top of it. But there's some Mm -hmm. people out there. No matter how hard you work, the world is very big, and we are all very small. Yeah, you ain't lying, man. I mean, you just said it. It's like, you know, to (laughs) beat. To be a hooper, man, if you're like six four, six five in the league right now, man, you're, you're still small. Like people are getting, I know guys, my, my very close friends of mine, they get turned down in the NBA because they're only six six. You know what I'm saying? Like, like so, so but, but, but there is no height or weight that's required to be a Warren Buffett. There is no height or weight that's required to be an, an exceptional business individual. Like there is nothing. It's just. Freaking, are you going to do it? And then putting your head down and getting the job done. So you're right. There is a better probability for that. I, I don't know if people understand that, but um, if people did realize it, maybe they would approach it a little bit differently. And, you know, it doesn't need to be done. All you need to know is that it's it's possible and that it can be done. You know what I'm saying? So I like where you, I like where you're going with that. And that's true. That's very true. Yeah, it's impossible for me to be a pro athlete. It is possible for me to be <laughs> someone in the business world. So, like, what was taking what you learned being a top level athlete? What was the one thing that you learned from being an athlete that helped separate yourself from your peers in the business world that might have been, might have started like ahead of you, like when you came out, but you mm-hmm. caught them really fast? Like, you know, if you and I were to run a sprint, I could probably start at the 30 yard line, but by the time we get to the hundred, <laughs> you're probably still going to beat me. Right. Right. I mean, I don't know the biggest takeaway. The biggest takeaway is, you know, I'll say this much. It's obviously work ethic. I'll, I'll say two things to answer that question. The first thing is work ethic, right? People think they work and then you get next to people that actually work. And, 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 and so I feel that you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. So if you're only used to being exposed to one level of work, one level of grit, one level of grind, one level of just total domination as far as output is concerned, that's the only level that you can reach. So when, 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 when the, the thing that I was able to achieve when transitioning from sports to, you know, firstly, it was sales, then it was businesses. Everybody around me thought they worked hard. But they didn't because I saw a completely different level. But, you know, I am thankful by the grace of the man. But I've been around Olympian athletes like you think if you go to facilities where Olympic people train and, and you see what type of work they're doing, it is on another level than you would even imagine. Like, you get to see, like, you're like, God dang, like, no wonder they get the gold medal. No wonder they do, they they, they, they get the things that they get. That's a whole different degree of work. And I wouldn't know that that degree existed if I wasn't exposed to it. So that's the first thing, right? That's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is this. You always got to be on. There is no shutoff point. And, 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 and when you're playing sports, you can never be off. There was never a time where you're off. And I mean, from nutrition, I mean, from understanding a playbook, I mean, from execution on a practice field, I mean, from being in a game and then it just going full circle over and over and over again, like everything is for the thing you can never turn off. And then what I did when I went to sales is I realized that I could never turn off as well. Hey, listen, Bobby Bowden never turned off. Jimbo Fisher never turned off. I worked alongside Grant Cardone, for those who don't know, for five years. That guy never turns off. The greatest athletes I've been around in my entire life never turn off. The businessmen who are worth billions and billions and billions of dollars never shut off. 
And so the common denominator is don't shut off. I remember this one thing that I was told one time. It's, you know, we, I live here in Miami, Florida. And um, the American Airlines Arena, even though it's, it's called something else now, everybody knows that the American Airlines Arena, so we'll call it the American Airlines Arena just for this case. You know, it takes more energy to shut that arena off and then turn on all the power back on in that arena than it does just to keep the lights on. And that's the same situation as far as momentum is concerned. If you turn off for four days, it takes a ton of energy to turn back on and get that get that momentum going. All the elites, they stay on. So what I try to take in every single part of my day is never turn off, dog. Never, never, never. Always going to be on your game, no matter what. And to. when you first enter the game, you may have a little bit of uh, – imposter syndrome because you're in a new place you're like oh man i don't even know if i should be here or not and so you could just outwork everyone and then eventually once you start to learn the game you start to play the game a lot differently versus like using your there's yeah. probably a point where you could use just your straight athleticism to to beat people then your mm -hmm. athleticism only takes you so far mm -hmm. and then you start playing a different game with people start playing mm -hmm. mind games start playing the game mm -hmm. within the game as someone might say Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, when, when you say that, the first thing that comes to mind is you first got to know, you first got to understand the playbook. You got to understand what's what's being asked of you and you got to drill on those fundamentals. You got to drill on that core foundation. Then and only then can you build and actually play your own game. It's like in Pop Warner, man, like. Maybe there are some disguises in Pop Warner, but in Pop Warner, bro, you line up in cover two. You line up in cover three. You line up in man press. You line up in quarters. You line up in, in whatever whatever the, the defense is. And these are kids. These are these are kids. They don't have the foundation to play the game within the game. They're still learning the game. They're still learning mm -hmm. the lineups, right? They're still learning. Like, they, they got to line up in that thing. Now, you take it to high school. Okay, it's different. You take it to college. Okay, way different. You take it to the pros. Now a guy can show that he's in three, but right before the snap of the ball, he goes into man press. The only way that they can do that, though, was because they, they, they already have their core fundamentals instilled in them. So, yeah, you're playing a game within the game, but I don't think you can get to that level until you really understand the root fundamental of the game and can execute it over and over and over and over and over again. It's exactly like a sales process, man. Exactly like a sales process. You can put your own flair on a sales process, but only when you truly understand the sales process. Otherwise, it won't work. Your own flair. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I would have to say for that. Yeah, you got to stay true to yourself in the business world. Mm -hmm. uh, because people will see through if you're being ingenuine. So mm -hmm. like something I've done, and I, I mean, maybe you've taken a different approach is I've just like taken things from different people and like put my own little spin on it. Like I might see someone do, do a, a move or say a line. I was like, Ooh, I, I like that line. Or I like the way he presented that, but I would do it this way. So that way it stays mm -hmm. genuine to me with the fundamentals that you had to learn in the business world. What was that hardest fundamental for you to master in order to get to, Step mm. two, three, four. Yeah, the hardest fundamental I had to master was understanding sales. That's it. That's it. And people think they know how to sell. They don't. They don't freaking know how to sell. People think they know how to communicate. They have no idea how to communicate. People think they're high ticket closers. You ain't no damn high ticket closer. Like people think. Like the. The, it, it's just, it's just, and, 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 and I thought the same thing until I got indoctrinated into an ecosystem that humbled myself, that humbled myself in the sense of, bro, these people know how to sell. These people can close somebody on two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight million on a cold call in 30 minutes. Like there's not a lot of people in the world that can do that. And you, you can think you're good. But usually the people that think they're good or say they good, if you're really good, you don't got to say it. I got I got into an ecosystem where people didn't have to say they were good. They were just good and you could see it in the numbers. 
it's a you tie that on back into the hardest thing that I had to kind of kind of really learn and dial in on was number one, understanding the importance of sales, but then number two, just understanding sales, bro. Like literally understanding sales. Like, can you talk about sales for weeks and months and years? If you cannot talk about sales for weeks and months and years, you don't know sales. You don't. And so, and so it, it took it took three, four years to really develop that skill set. Um, and being in that high powered, that high powered environment. But once that, once it clicked, then I was like, okay, now we got this sales thing down. What, what's the core essence of business marketing and sales and marketing is just a form of sales. Marketing is the meet and greet and fact finding. And it just, it just, it just shortens the sales process because it eliminates the, 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 the unknown you become known already. And then you get introduced to a product and service and then people just drop. So, so those are the only two things. Everything else will figure itself out if you got these two things figured out. So really figuring out the sales game, bro, I'm telling you, man, that was the hardest, but the the, the most impactful thing that's been achieved so far when, 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 when we talk about, you know, a skill set that maybe has been, been developed. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I went to school for math. And when I got into the investment world, I thought, investment people knew about investments and I quickly realized they're just all salespeople. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I was like, man, I was like, okay, well, if I actually know about investments and have an understanding of how they work, that gives me an advantage because the sales thing is a skill. Like you can learn it, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but there's certain things that you can't teach such as uh, having that, that X factor or just having that innate ability to act off a script. Cause some people, yeah. You may be working at a car dealership or you work at a, what I like to call a big faceless organization. Mm -hmm. Sales there is easy. Like the people mm -hmm. are already coming to you, but as soon as you get into business for yourself and you have to get people to trust you because they, and they don't even recognize your company's name. That is where you really learn how good you are at sales because working at a large corporation, if I say, Hey, I'm calling from Microsoft people are like oh I know what Microsoft is versus mm -hmm. this is Josh Kraftchick it's like who who's this yeah man yeah man but you just said something that's huge you never want to open up with what the business that you're calling from unless the business is a household name because that that'll just discredit you on the phone right off the bat within the first two seconds hey this is Mike with Microsoft okay you can drop the name but if you're working for something that's not known hey what's going on this is Mike good morning good morning yes hey the reason for the call today is and then you get right on into your process so you just said something that's gold that hopefully everybody caught on to because well if they did it now they did because I just highlighted it for real yeah and I mean being in sales if you're going to go in the business the most important item that people don't realize is where are you going to find your customers? Everyone's like, Oh, I got to have a pretty mm. website. I got to have this. Mm. I got to have that. It's like a uh, funny mm. story. I was looking at uh Berkshire Hathaway's website. Yeah. Berkshire. Yeah. Their, their website hasn't been updated since like 1996, man. <laughs> and they're like one of the richest companies in the world. Uh, obviously they have a lot of different other companies that have great websites, but you don't need a great website to, crushing in sales you need you need volume and you need grit it's a contact mm -hmm. sport mm -hmm. well that's real man that's so real man you need volume i think the hardest thing when opening up a business or starting a business is building your brand so people understand what it is you do they become accustomed to what you stand for and then bro you just said it yourself leads leads people to talk to it takes a ton of effort to build a brand to the point where leads just come in you know i wish we were all mcdonald's i wish we all had a drive through and i wish hundreds of millions of people just came knocking on my door every single day and said hey i'll just take a number two but we're not that so what are you doing every single day to drive leads and drive opportunities? And then realizing that every single person that you speak to in some way, shape or form is a leader opportunity and or can connect you 
with the potential leader opportunity. You really got to go into like assassin mode. You got to go into like a farmer. You just got to plant and see shit sprout all over the place. And, and, and again, it goes into the point. That's why you can never turn off because you never know the conversation that you have. You never know the outreach that you do. That's to the actual right person, but you got to keep doing it and you got to keep looking for it. So bro, leads. If you got leads, that's, 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 that's literally half the battle. And then it goes into, well, leads are only as good as the people who work them. So then I worked with the organizations in my past role where they had a ton of leads, but no one knew how to pick up the phone. No one knew how to conversate. No one knew how to work a process through. No one knew how to set an appointment. No one knew how to get an appointment to show up. Everybody, everybody was pitching on their demo for five or six or seven or 20 or 30 minutes and then stating the price. No one knew how to negotiate. No one knew how to close. So, 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 so there's other things other than leads, but if you get the leads thing down, right, I mean, my God, the other stuff can just be taught like quick. You can just learn that fast, you know? Yeah. Just the other day I had someone who directly reached out to me for help with their financial situation. Mm -hmm. And I called him and he goes, Hey, like I, I realized my company offers free services. And I was like, well, what was the point in reaching out to me if you were just going to take the free option? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I liked your profile and I like this and I like that. I was like, well, I mean, if something's free, like, don't you think there's some sort of catch behind it or something? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and he was like, well, I never thought about it that way. And I was like, listen, a lot of people offer something for free and it may be free, but ultimately there's going to be some sort of product and it's typically one product that is a one size fits all solution for every single person that they talk to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the, fr listen, the free product is the funnel, bro. You, you gotta get, I mean, bro, that's the funnel. Like, like, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't even say there's a catch to it. I would just say, you gotta understand that you're entering the funnel. Like the only reason why people move forward is, be, is, is, is because there's a value exchange. If you start providing value before you even ask for something, then that individual is more apt to hear or take more. So like, they're just entering the funnel. You know, with this free thing, the only thing I think with whenever I think of free is what Grant used to tell us. He used to tell us what's free will cost you and what costs you actually makes you money. So free content is incredible and you can change a ton of stuff with free content. But sooner or later, you're going to have to pay if you want to have I pay results. Like it just is what it is. So understand that. Um and then realize whenever you, you 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 encounter something that's for free, you know, go ahead and take it. But but don't discredit yourself that you're only worth free stuff. That's literally what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like you're worth the investment. You're worth to spend money. Otherwise, you know, why are you even here? Like why why are you even like what's the point? So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I was I was like. As soon as I started charging for my initial consultations, I use that as like a weave out system. Mm. I don't ask for a lot of money. I'm like, listen, it's twenty nine ninety nine. If you don't like me, and it literally says this: if you don't like me, <laughs> mm -hmm. I will give you your money back. But I'm looking for people who are like, hey, I'm willing to put down twenty nine ninety nine to talk to this person. It's like, hey, if I want really good health services, do I want to go to the free clinic or do I want to go to the Mayo Clinic? One's gonna probably cost me a lot more money. But I'm gonna be working with people that are probably a lot more qualified than at yeah. the free clinic. Um, yeah. So I mean, it comes it, it comes down to that. It's a mindset thing, and that's a one thing a lot of business people get get wrong is like, oh, like I just I need as many leads as possible. It's like you need as many qualified leads mm -hmm. as possible because if you're talking to people, if you're gonna talk to some people, like I don't care who 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 they're talking to. It could be Warren Buffett. Or Jesus himself, they're never gonna do mm. anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. If they don't got a problem, 
if they don't got a problem that you can solve, you're honestly just wasting your time and, and, and equally as important, you're wasting their time. Yeah. Like they got to be qualified. They got to read the right, the right buyer. And, and, and the qualification thing, it doesn't mean that they need to know that they're qualified, but at least you need to know that they have a problem that they've yet identified that you can potentially solve. And then it's your opportunity or it's your responsibility to then convert them into a person that realizes that they need or would be open to having what it is that you represent. Yeah. And that's like the biggest thing is like, not every lead is a lead you actually want to talk to. So figuring mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. how to get the people who have a mindset where they are at least open to exploring a possibility on how someone could help them. That doesn't mean every single person's going to sign up, but it, as long as you're talking to people who are at least open to the conversation that's mm-hmm. when you know you're onto something. I'd rather have two really good meetings and none of those people close just because maybe it's not a good fit rather than having 20 meetings a day and 18 of them are terrible. Now I'm just wasting time and energy. I don't have to waste. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm totally, totally in agreement with you. Totally in agreement with you. And then, you know, you can play devil's advocate with that too. And this is, this is something that I had to learn and and figure out too it's like just because a deal isn't good right now doesn't mean that it's not going to be a deal in a year so you know one of the things is like okay one of the principles we were always taught is you know treat everybody as a buyer because at some point in their life they're going to be a buyer so now maybe you're not necessarily selling them on the product and service maybe now you're selling them on yourself and that you actually care and you're planting a seed right like you said And then later on in the future, it could potentially be a deal. But you obviously want to have the conversations that are applicable to now over the conversations that are applicable to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years down the road. Knowing that at the exact same time, just like you're going to need a deal right now, you're going to need a deal six, seven, eight, nine years down the road. So that's where that pipeline comes into play. That's where we're we're understanding where people fall. That's where your follow up systems come into play. That's where we're 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 really identifying what you're speaking to, and then putting them into the to the timeline of of okay, maybe I can ping them. That's where that comes into play, and and that's a skill set in and of itself, man. You know, that's a skill set in and of itself. For sure, I, I I don't know how many people I have that never signed up with me. I still have their contact info. Every three, six, or nine months, I just go in, send them all an email, maybe make a video. I'm just like, hey, it's me. Mm-hmm. I have mm-hmm. some updates on the investment world for you. This is what I'm doing. Hope you find this helpful. Have a good day. Now I'm back in their head. Or And then I have someone reach back out to me like, hey, Josh, I was just thinking about you the other day. Let's set up a meeting. And I mean, you Boom. just keep doing that, keep bringing the value. And then you open up the door. And most importantly, you don't push people through the door. You let them come to the door. And that mm-hmm. that's when it became a million times easier for me rather than trying to trying to do things that people were not ready to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the cure to that is just having so many people that you talk to that, you know, even if you talk to 10 people that aren't ready to move forward right now, you have 455 other conversations that you have to have that you know you got 10 people right now. You know, it's just a pipeline thing. It's just a pipeline thing. But you're you're, you're spot on, bro. You're spot on. So you working with Grant Cardone's organization, then you decided to start your agency. Uh, right. What was that process like? Um, I mean, listen. It wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't crazy. It wasn't like extremely like difficult. Like it wasn't like, it was just, okay, I'm going to do something for me. Now I'm going to build something with my last name on it. You know, one of the biggest things, the reasons why we're able to get, you know, the traction that we have right now is because as opposed to me realize, or as opposed to me thinking that I need to learn anything and everything about our business and how to fulfill and so on and so forth, even though I still learn it and I still know it, you know, collaboration is the new currency these days and eyeballs is the number one currency, right? So, you know, you bring people on board who have certain skill sets, 
that saves you time and allows for you to fulfill immediately at an incredibly high level. And then I know my own skill sets. My own skill sets are sales. My skill sets are effective communication. My skill set is building personal brand. My skill set is work in a room. My skill set is 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 that front facing type individual. Okay, that's great. I, I I do what I need to do. We created a partnership, myself and my partner. We hired individuals underneath us and he's an expert in what he does. Now, of course, we meet together every single day. We go over strategies every single day. We learn from each other every single day. We We continue to develop from each other every single day. But as far as like, Was there $500,000 that needed to be invested? No. Did we have a website before we got started? Hell no. Did we we print out business cards before we took on our first client? Hell no. Hell no. The thing that we did is the thing, the thing that we did is, is understanding how we can solve a problem, understanding both of our skill sets, combining those forces, and then starting to fulfill. Then everything else happened. So, I'm just thankful I know how to sell. That's huh, it. Yeah. yeah. Now, with your agency, what sort of organizations or people need to come to you at what point for, for you to take them from the red zone to the end zone? Hell yeah, bro. Hell yeah. So, you know, you know, here's the deal. We 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 are retention marketing firm. We specialize in retention marketing. So retention marketing is increasing the lifetime value of a consumer, right? And we do that by 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 optimizing the data that businesses have as it relates to their current pur- purchasing population. We primarily work with product based brands, product based mm-hmm. brands that have a multiple a multiple amount of SKUs that they can offer and ascend the consumer through a buying cycle, right? So we partner up with organizations that are anywhere from three to five mil as far as revenue, all the way on up to, bro, we've worked with eBay. We work with Lines Not Cheap, Timber, Acubo, Tectonic, uh, Love and Pebble, uh, Fab Defense, uh, Ball and Buck, like, like big, big organizations, man, big organizations, Chaos Fishing, you know, it, it's just a matter of, do they have a strong e-commerce presence? Can they sell online? Do they have a number of SKUs, right? And then do they have the data to support it? Primarily the businesses that we partner up with, you know, they have 10, 15, 20, 100, 200, 400, 800, a million emails, a million uh, pieces of data on a consumer, but they're they're not optimizing it. Did you know that if you're in the e-com space specifically or in your product based um, uh, space specifically, that the industry standard what should be what should be taking place is anywhere from 30 to 35 to upwards of 40% of your revenue should come from retention marketing should come from people who already said yes but on average these same businesses are usually running at 8 to 10% of their total revenue comes from retention they they, they spend all this money to get a consumer and then they spend more money to get another consumer and more money to get another consumer. And they're not doubling down and realizing, okay, we already got someone in the door as opposed to them buying one thing. We have 150 other things that they could buy as well. So that's the problem that it is that we solve. And those are the type of businesses that we work with some of the businesses that we work with. And those are ideal clients as it relates to where we can move the needle the quickest. We cannot partner up with somebody who just got started yesterday. Why? Not because we don't want to, but because they don't have the data. And we are a data-driven company in the sense of we move the needle with businesses' data. So they need to have data in order for us to move the needle. And if they don't, we're just not the correct fit at that time. Just saw the Salesforce commercial with Matthew McConaughey. (laughs) Data's the new gold. Bro, it is, man. I mean, isn't it? I mean, bro, like, it is. Yeah, you got to know you got to know where your customer is and most importantly you got to figure out how to retain clients to get that recurring revenue mm-hmm. stream by keeping the product really really good. I mean, that's something that we've really focused on is we get a client and we want them to remain not a client. We want them to remain not a cut. Cu- we don't want them to be a customer. We want them to be a client. We want them to remain wow. a client till the end of time. 
And we can mm-hmm. only do that by making the product really, really good. So in the short run, running this business uh, probably didn't do as much outreach and calling <laughs> and client acquisition as we could have have. However, if we didn't make the product really good to start out with by having that playbook, by putting in the fundamentals, then we're just going to be working harder by bringing people in and then they're just going to leave because the product sucks. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, no, no. That makes total sense. You know. Yeah. When you say this product thing, I think of like Alex Ramosi and his books and whatnot, like. Um, and, and hundred million dollar offers or hundred million dollar leads or whatever it is. And he talks about that too, man. It's like, if you have a product that's so damn good, you don't even need to sell it. The marketing will take care of itself. What were the people, where the people, where people dominate is when they have an exceptional product and they have exceptional outreach. Mm-hmm. Those are the people yeah. that ball, you know? So, yeah. But yeah, the product is everything, man. You can't have a shit product. Well, you can, but then you better be very, very, very good at marketing then. Yeah, you know, or, no, like, or, like or you better real. be working on how to fix it. Exactly, exactly. Well, well, what I'm saying is this, McDonald's has a shit burger. Everybody still buys it. Are they optimizing their burger? No. No. <laughs> that's that's perfect example so it's just like it's like where do you fall in this business thing but obviously you want to have an incredible product you want to have incredible marketing and you want to have um some some pretty significant outreach and then fulfillment that supports everything you know for sure now like what what else are y'all focusing on biz- mm-hmm. business wise for 2024 that you're looking to improve upon from last mm-hmm. year yeah, man. So the fulfillment aspect is is one. The other thing is like, you know, we have to have a ladder within our within our organization, right? We we deal retention, we deal with retention marketing right now, but how do we how do we bring more to our current clients? You know, we get we get we get res- uh, a request for CRO optimization, conversion rate optimization, or or we get requests maybe to run ads or or maybe it's UGC created content and, and kind of helping people out there. So it's really a matter of, okay, we're, we're perfecting this retention piece, but then how do we couple other, other services with retention because we're getting asked by our current clients, you guys are doing an incredible job. What else can you do? What else do you do? But we knew that we had to get this retention thing down first. So that's what we're focusing on this year is is adding or, or figuring out what it is we could potentially add. If it's now great, if it's in the in the future, great. That would support our current existing clientele. And then also, bro, the thing that we're looking to approve is 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 the brand of the company. The thing that we're looking to approve is the amount of clients that we have. You know, client acquisition is everything. It has to be. So that's, you know, that's, that's also what we're focused on is just developing those, developing better processes for it. You know, we've only been around for less than two years. We, 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 we initially were just a, 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 a uh, marketing firm, but then we niched down and then we went into retention marketing. So just think of it, those names that I just stated, some of those names are worth billions and billions and billions of dollars, those brands. And that's not to boast because I feel like we haven't done anything yet. But bro, that's only within five and a half months. Wait till we get to 12. How are you going to get yeah. there? Yeah. Well, I just need 12 months to happen. I've only been doing it for five and a half months. So just let me get to 12. That's it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just give me the time. But we're, 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 we're on a mission to build a billion dollar brand, man. So we'll do it. We'll do it. Billion dollar marketing company? Billion dollar brand, not necessarily billion dollar marketing company. That there are billion dollar marketing companies like Zimmer Marketing. They're at like four billion and whatnot. But we're more focused on like the brand. I think the long term vision is for us to have our own um, R and D and our own products and owning those brands and being able to sell those products based off the data that we collected while running retention marketing and other marketing strategies 
for some of these other biggest brands that the world has to offer. If we already know how the consumer buys, we already know the cadence of which they buy in. We already know how to segmentize them. We already know to acquire the customer and bring them in into the funnel. You already got the process figured out. Now it's okay. Now I'll just have a product. So we want to own like 30 or 40 products, right? And be like an incubator. But that's long-term vision that's down the road. That's five, six, seven years. Right now, we're, we're, we know where we're at right now. We're, 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 we're perfecting where we're at currently. So, Well, it's cool stuff. Before, before I let you hop off here, what is your favorite memory playing football? Mm. <laughs> oh, man, that's so tough. Um. Maybe like a play or like just like a moment that like I first remember one that pops I, into your head. Yeah, the first one that pops into my head was um there's two things. There's two things. The first thing, the first one was when I when I when I when I when I saw real speed. And I'll never forget it, it was when we were playing Miami. It's doing special teams. Travis Benjamin got the ball. This is when I'm a freshman. Travis is about to graduate. Travis Benjamin, that's the wide receiver for Miami, University of Miami. He got the ball. And when he took off, I kid you not, there was like wind that went past me. And right then and there, I'll never forget that moment. Right then and there, I said, oh, so these boys are fast, fast. And, and 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 that's when that's when it, it like it like you went from a boy to a man in the sense of bro everybody's fast out here everybody's big out here you better you better level up I'll never forget that when he when he when he was running it was like wind it was like literally like and I was just like God dang these boys okay now it's time to level up so that's the first thing the second the second thing is I mean. Listen, we, we, we won some great games, bro. You know, on the road, you know, ACC championships. Like, you know, that was great. But I remember when Dustin Dustin Hopkins um, kicked the game-winning field goal at, um, at Dope Campbell. And I think we were playing Clemson at the time, if I'm not mistaken. There's like three seconds left on the clock. He got the ball and he, and he kicked it. And I think this is in like 2000 and – I think this is like 2010 or yeah, it's 2010. This is when, this is when Clemson was on the come up. I think the they had up. Taj Boyd as their quarterback. Yeah, they had Taj. They had Taj. Was, was CJ Spiller on that team too? Um, he but he was before that time because I was at Florida State from 2008 2012, right? So CJ was, I think CJ was a a, 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 a senior in 2008 2009, I believe. I believe. Um. But I remember when Dustin Hopkins made that kick and it was like the most electrifying, electrifying feeling because we just stormed the field. Like everybody's just like, let's go. Like, I remember he like ran way across the field, like went, had his hands up, like God, and we were just like, let's go. And we all ran, bro, I'll never forget that. And then obviously meeting Miami in the center of the field in Doak and um, us almost getting to a fight. I'll never forget those moments, bro. There's so many memorable moments, man. Like, it's just crazy. But those are the top one to two that come to mind. What is most special about what you just said is you didn't pick individual accolade. You picked it where a teammate allowed the team to win. And that's mm. definitely a superpower people need to learn when they go into the business world. It's not about you. It's about the team. And if you can get the team mm. to win, then you will win. No, man. Without a team... You cannot win, ultimately win, for real. Cool. Well, great having you on, Mike. We'll see everyone next time. Bye, everyone.